What's up everybody, my name is Godzi, and welcome back to some more Umaneko When They Cry questions arc. Last episode, blah 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 drama, blah blah blah, Kraus can't read contract, so he get angry. Who oh boy, alright. So I just recorded for like 30 minutes of me just talking, I recorded my fall 2018 previews video, which is coming soon. Should be out Saturday or Sunday, one of the two. So look forward to that. That is, of course, relative to when I posted this video. So if you're watching this, like, a week afterward, then yeah, it's already out, or should be. So watch that, because it's funny and it's good and stuff. Either way, let's get into this shit. I don't know what's gonna happen. All I know is someone saying, hmm, quite an entertaining scheme. Why then? What are the conditions they've attached? Well... Whether or not Kraus act- Oh, it's an- it's a servant. I don't know which one, though. Well, whether or not Kraus actually discovers the gold, he'll pay Eva, Rudolph, and Rosa a total of 7.5 billion yen for their shares. However, 10% of that will be paid before March. Oh, it was- Okay, Kinzo and Genji, I guess. <laughs> Kraus, you dunce. To think he would have his feet swept out from under him by his younger siblings. How truly amusing. But it sounds as though they tripped when going in for the kill, yes? Oh, it's canon? I thought it would be Genji, okay. Yes. Kraus exposed the fact that Eva and the younger siblings all have an urgent need to get money. Humph. Is there even any need to expose such ob obvious facts? That irresolute, incompetent man. What are they doing now? That conversation has been put on hold for the time being. Now Beatrice's epitaph is being discussed. So, they're trying to solve the riddle and find out where my gold is hidden. Yes. Kinzo set down his spectacles and snorted. I'm the fucking goldsmith. They can't deal with this shit. I they're never gonna find my gold. You know why? Cause they're gonna need some bird heal if they're gonna find that shit. Ha 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 ha! Will the miracle be fulfilled first, or will those fools expose the gold first? What a show this will be! At the very moment those fools solve my puzzle, I will suffer utter defeat. They can suck my corpse down to the last fragment of bone. The greed of fools can allow great magic to bring forth a miracle, and yet. If the fulfillment of the miracle comes first, if it comes first, Beatrice will be resurrected again. The smile I've been chasing half my life will be restored. Oh, Beatrice, soon will come the sacred night when we shall bet upon a miracle and the game of demons shall begin. I will surely prove triumphant and survive. I'll let you have the lives of all those others. I don't need wealth or honor or assets or gold or anything. Interesting, so he understands, like, the Twilight game, or whatever they called it. All I want is to see your smile one last time. <coughs> Took the words right out of my mouth, Kinzo. Cough, cough, cough. Kinzo choked, apparently in great pain. Cannon got closer and tried to pat his master's back, but Kinzo motioned for him to stop. Do you know why I went to the trouble of exposing the hidden location of the gold in a place that everyone can see? No. It is because magical power is determined by risk. If the number of people who try to discover Beatrice's gold is great, and the danger of them succeeding is great as well, then the power of magic will bring about a grand miracle if we succeed despite the odds. In other words, magic is a game. It is not the case that the one who performs the best becomes the victor. The victor performs the best because he has been granted magic. Do you see? It is similar to how the miracle of life can be granted only after winning against the divine odds of several hundred million to one. Is this a little difficult for you? My apologies. That's fine. It all comes down to this. I didn't know Kinza was... good with cannon. I thought he was only good with Genji, but whatever. I will give all that I have built up to the one who solves the mystery of Beatrice's epitaph. Wealth, honor, gold, and the inheritance of the Ushiromiya family. Everything that I have established. 
My children certainly aren't the only ones with the right to attempt to solve this riddle. Anyone who solves the riddle will have the right to gain everything. Even you. Yes. However, I couldn't possibly understand such a difficult riddle. Of course, I made it difficult. But you must try to solve it as well. That will form the seed that summons the miracle of my magic. If everyone attempts it and everyone fails, that will be that. However, if the miracles come together and give birth to magical power, it will happen. Beatrice will revive. That is why you must attempt it too. Everyone must attempt it. And in doing, they will give strength to my magic. Do you understand? Yes, I will try. For a long while, Kinzo repeatedly muttered to himself, agitated and clutching at his head. Cannon stayed where he was, alert and unmoving, until he was given the next order from his master. Kinzo eventually realized this. Very well, leave me. There is a bag of sweets on the liquor cabinet. You can take some with you as a reward. I'm fine. After all, I am furniture. Hmm. <clears throat> so furniture doesn't eat sweets. Well, I suppose it stands to reason. In that case, leave me. Yes. Excuse me. Kinzo was being nice to you, Cannon, and you turned down his sweet tarts or whatever he put on the liquor cabinet. Cannon bowed and left the study. As the door closed, a heavy locking noise sounded out. Ooh, that's the sound that happens when you boot up the game. But it was not the sound of Cannon locking the door. It was the door locking automatically. No one could enter without Kinzo's permission, and once they left, they could not enter again. It was a mechanism that Kinzo, unable to trust his blood relatives, had created to seal himself up in his own study and isolate himself from the outside world. So he made that himself? I mean, that's kinda cool. Auto-locking doors? Well, that's kind of already a thing. Whatever. He was already unable to trust anyone excepting... Wait. Fuck, I, I can't read words, even though I just read for like 30 minutes, out loud, with minimal fuck-ups. He was already unable to trust anyone excepting, not the children who shared his blood, but those servants who called themselves furniture. So he only trusts the servants. I mean, that's fair enough. He pays them to be servants, or assuming he pays them. Nanjo, how are you feeling? Ah, Genji. Oh, it's just that there's no place for me to be anymore. With a bitter laugh, Nanjo turned to face the door to the parlor. That look was apparently enough to tell Genji what Nanjo wanted to say. For the most part, Genji also understood the family situation. It must have made him want to frown, knowing that right now in the lounge, the master he served was being discussed so disrespectfully. But it would have been very difficult to gather that from his indifferent expression. Still, I don't understand. Why did Kinzo have something so provocative written, I wonder? Nanjo looked at the portrait of Beatrice. I have a feeling that this is like the last part before shit hits the fan. Either this or next episode, because it's gotta be winding up to it soon. No, he actually directed his gaze beneath the portrait, at the plate with the epitaph. I do not presume to understand the master's thoughts. However, I'm sure he had a deep reason for doing so. Since long ago, when Kinzo played chess, he would always prepare his moves according to some far-reaching judgment. Yes, sometimes even to make moves I couldn't understand. For an average person like me, it was impossible to see through to whatever it was he was planning. Sometimes, I wonder if this might be some kind of will in the Master's eyes. I keep on changing Genji's voice, I'm sorry, but I can't remember it. Perhaps he wishes to hand over his wealth and title to the one who can understand it. So you're thinking he may have wanted the four siblings to work together and solve the riddle. Before some outsider like me, myself, solved it. Kinzo may speak of his children in insulting terms, but perhaps he also wants them to repair their relationship. Ooh, I'm gonna kill everyone! It certainly would be heartwarming if, as Nanjo had suggested, Nanjo rather, this epitaph had been made to repair the siblings' relationship. However, both Nanjo and Genji knew that nothing could be more impossible than this. They'd known Kinzo longer than anyone, and Kinzo trusted them more than his own relatives. 
But even they cannot guess at his true motives. The Master always says that everyone has the right to try and solve the riddle, even if they aren't a member of his family. What about you, Dr. Nanjo? No, no, it's a little too difficult a puzzle for this senile old man. Actually, I once wrote this epitaph down on my notebook. Night after night, I would try to solve it before going to sleep. But, <laughs> it really is hard. It looks like we might have some free time to relax and consider it before someone comes to get us. What do you say, Genji? I am nothing more than furniture in service to the Master. Golden assets are unnecessary to me. My, you're very modest. I imagine that's why Kinzo trusts you so much. If so, I am honored. I can't understand how people can just willingly be a servant, just, like, be so pessimistic and self-deprecating, like, Hi, nice to meet you, I'm a fucking couch. As Nanjo- Nanjo- As Nanjo lightly laughed in response, he once again looked at the epitaph. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved hometown. You who seek the Golden Land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. The epitaph on the portrait called My Beloved Witch Beatrice goes as follows. Okay, we're actually reading the epitaph. Behold the Sweetfish River, we already read this part, whatever. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved hometown. You who seek the Golden Land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. As you travel down it, you will see a village. In that village, look for the shore the two will tell you of. There sweeps the key to the Golden Land. The one who obtains the key must then travel to the Golden Land in accordance with these rules. On the first twilight, offer the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two who are close. On the third twilight, those who remain shall praise my noble name. On the fourth twilight, gouge the head and kill. On the fifth twilight, gouge the chest and kill. On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. On the seventh twilight, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth twilight, gouge the leg and kill. On the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive and none shall be left alive. On the tenth twilight, at journey's end, you shall attain to the power of the Golden Land's treasures, once and for the last time. The witch shall praise the wise and bestow four treasures. One shall be all the gold from the Golden Land. One shall be the resurrection of all the dead souls. One shall be the resurrection of the love that was lost. One shall be to put the witch to sleep for all time. Sweet peacefully, my beloved witch, Beatrice. So Kinzo wrote that? Ooh, the flowers. It's a transition screen. And you have to wait it out because pressing the arrow key does nothing. Ooh, what time is it? It's no longer 2 p.m.? It's 3 p.m. Funky. Who boy? I boy. <laughs> oh boy. Whoa boy. Ooh, dingy dingy. Ooh, it's like a little cutscene scroller. So what's going on here? Oh, the beach. So, on the 10th twilight, the journey ends, and you reach the Golden Land. You really are diligent, Maria. You did a good job writing this all down. Dude, are they not concerned by a lot of it? Because they're just like, oh, gouge the knee and kill. Like, I can understand, like, head, I can understand stomach. What the fuck? Oh, I'm gonna cut your knee and you die. Huh. Ew. I forget a lot, so I always write things down. Mama told me to. There was a notebook inside the handbag Maria was always carrying around. That's right, she does carry that around everywhere. And Beatrice's epitaph was copied onto it. Thanks to that, we were able to we were all able to challenge the puzzle of the epitaph while walking down this beach. Jessica and the rest had already tried to solve it several times, and they had already gotten bored with it. However, since this was a first for me, I was so excited that I couldn't stop. It really tickled my sense of adventure. Let's start with the first line. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved hometown. Where was Grandfather's hometown again? I heard that before the war, the Ushiro Mia family had a mansion near Odawara. Which makes you want to know which Sweetfish River flows through Odawara, right? Yeah, because that river would be the starting place. Anyone searching for the Golden Land would head down that and search for the key. 
What's this river in Odawara? Does it have sweet fish swimming in it? If you're looking for sweet fish in Odawara, it'd have to be Hayakawa. It's famous for its mountain stream fishing. Ew! I hate fish! <laughs> Maria, you'll understand when you get a bit older. Wick, 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 salty roasted sweet fish. Yummy. Even though we just ate, I'm getting hungry again. Oh yeah, her. I forgot Shannon's a character in this game. Um, shall I bring you a biscuit? Huh? D do I look like a dog to you, you fucking bitch? Oh, sorry, that's not what I meant. Don't mind it. Shannon was faithfully keeping us company, since she didn't have any afternoon chores for a while. Sorry if you hear my chair creaking, my chair creaks. So, yeah, it creaks. I would have thought that, since she's a servant, accompanying us would force her to take care of us and tire her out. But that didn't seem to be the case for her. On the contrary, she seemed to enjoy joining in on the conversation with people close to her age. When I asked, I heard that she was the sort of worker whose room and board were supplied by her employer. So normally, the only person close to her in age was Jessica. Yeah, I can imagine how that might be pretty dull. <laughs> Fucking burping, sorry. Okay, so I get that the sweet fish filled river near Odawara is Hayakawa. In that case, we've got to go down it. Do you find anything if you head down Hayakawa River? Um, if you follow it downstream, you'll arrive at the ocean. Of course, you'd reach the mouth of the river. The third line of the epitaph was, as you travel down it, you will see a village. By the way, since long ago, the mouths of rivers have been key points in transportation, and large cities tend to be built there. That'd be the next checkpoint. Hmm, that's a pretty good theory. Just like you guessed, there's an old city there that was very prosperous in ancient times. That's where Odawara Castle is. Ah, uh, I think I might have gone to Odawara Castle on a field trip once. It really was a wonderful castle. Yeah, I also went there. Even though I live in a western-style house, it's true that Japanese people feel calmer with a Japanese layout. I don't understand, like, the whole idea of, oh, western-style house. Do you mean onion domes, or do you mean, like, regular American house without tatami mats and regular doors? Ew. <laughs> Ew. That was fucking awful. Ew. Castles are boring. Theme parks are better. Ew. I see, I see. Okay. If we find the gold, the Great Battler will generously reserve a whole theme park for a day and let you play in it. Still, Odawara Castle, huh? The hidden gold of Odawara Castle. Uh ho! It's actually starting to sound pretty good! <laughs> well, we figured out that much two years ago. The village down the river where the sweet fish swim in Odawara, we figured it was probably somewhere near Odawara Castle. The problem is the next line. Okay, let's see where Batwar's strange reasoning can take him. Jessica grinned broadly. She seemed to be implying that she would have solved the puzzle long ago if it was that easy. Damn it. I'll definitely find it and keep it all for myself. The fourth line. In that village, look for the shore the two will tell you of. I don't know what it means by the two, but anyway, the shore. What does it mean by the shore? No, wait. Is there any place near, the, near there with shore or kishi in its name? Um... I've heard there's a place called Sogakishi in Odawara. Huh. Wow. You sure know a lot about it. Haha, <laughs> what could that mean? Shannon, are you trying to solve the riddle and get the gold too? That makes us rivals! It's not like I'm interested in gold. It's just that George told me about it before. That's because we reached the same conclusion two years ago. We even went to the trouble of laying out a map and looking it up. It was about five kilometers to the north of Odawara. We definitely found a place called Sogakishi there. However, after that, we get stuck. The fifth line doesn't say where the key is hidden in that place. Maria, could you read it for us? Ew. There sweeps the key to the Golden Land. Ew. I can read it! Sogakishi is probably large, and there wasn't ever any house built there by the Ushiromiya family. Not much we can do to find a key in such a vast area without any hints. You're right. And without the key, we can't advance to the next line. George, what kind of place is Sogakishi? Let's see. I've never been there, so I don't really know, but according to the map, it's in the mountains. I'm pretty sure it was at the base of Mount Asama. Hmm. Something doesn't feel right. You'd expect a riddle pointing the way to hidden gold to be a bit more exact. I get the feeling that even the part about Sogakishi was a mistake. Well, I think it could be Sogakishi. 
It could be talking about some house that Grandfather lived in when he was a kid that we don't know about. After all, the first line mentioned his beloved hometown. Shannon, you've served Grandfather alcohol and stuff lots of times, right? Hasn't he ever talked to you about his past? The Master almost never speaks of the past. However, he talks of the Great Kanto Earthquake as though it was someone else's story. So he may have been living far away from the Kanto area. The Ushiromiya family may have been living in Odawara, but not all of the branch families were. Grandfather often called himself part of a branch of a branch part of a branch of a branch family, the least connected to the successor. And that means the beloved hometown might not even be Odawara at all. I've never heard anything about Grandfather's hometown, and I doubt he'd actually tell me if I asked. If the so-called beloved hometown isn't referring to the Ushiromiya family's roots, then the Odawara theory is wrong from the beginning. Of course, this doesn't completely remove the possibility that it was Soga Kishi. For example, perhaps he lived in Odawara when he was very young, but then moved far away later. Ew. I don't understand what you're all talking about. Ew. Maria had been completely left out of the conversation, and she now sat puffing out her cheeks in boredom. <laughs> so basically, if we can't even agree on the starting point for this dice game of gold, we're totally stuck. But wait. After the first five lines, the thing we end up finding is a key, right? Even if you don't have a key, it's always possible to bust through a door. Can't we just skip the first five lines and start figuring out the rest? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh well, we're just wasting time anyway. Let's hear the rest of Batwar's reasoning. But in the next part, it gets dark really fast. Shannon frowned slightly. After looking back at Maria's notebook to recall what was written there, yeah, I was forced to agree. On the first twilight, offer the sex chosen by the key as sacrifices. It sure does get horrible quickly. But wouldn't you need the key to figure out the sex? I don't know. On the second twilight, it says to tear apart the two who are close. Does that mean to make them break off their loving relationship? Or does it mean to literally tear them apart? I don't know, but either way, it's pretty disgusting. Even if we set that second line aside, it mentions six people for the first twilight. Then five people for the fourth through eighth twilights. So at least eleven people must be sacrificed. Ew! They're sacrifices to revive Beatrice! I see. Sacrifices to restore the witch. Yeah, that's what it'd mean. Near the end, the witch will be revived on the ninth twilight. That last part is guaranteed. On the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive and none shall be left alive. So everyone will die in the end. And after that, the tenth twilight is the goal line. Not sure how you're supposed to reach the Golden Land if everyone's dead by then. Depending how you interpret it, the Traveler who holds the key may or may not be included in the None Shall Be Left Alive part. But at the end, there's something pretty interesting. After reaching the goal, the Witch gives out four treasures. One shall be all the gold, the problem is the next one. It says the dead souls will be resurrected, right? Doesn't that sound like it means everyone who died in the earlier lines? If you put it like that, then the part about reviving lost love might refer to the pair torn apart on the second twilight. That's right. And the fourth one refers to the ninth twilight. The fourth treasure is putting the witch, revived on the ninth twilight, to sleep. If we put a happy spin on all this, it'll be hectic with people dying and breaking up all over the place, but it'll all be made right in the, right in the end. So, if the riddle is actually true, then wouldn't that mean no one actually dies, the gold is just there? Because the witch goes back to sleep and everything, so yeah, that would make sense. The awakened, the awakened witch will sleep again, and everything will be like it was at the start except with a huge pile of gold. The witch must be- oh fuck. Oh, okay, it stayed. The witch must be pretty busy, what with all the killing, reviving, breaking up, and reuniting people. Not to mention waking up and sleeping. <laughs> Sheesh, just when the tale of the hidden gold was getting interesting, it all gets pretty dubious once the witch starts showing up. Too true. <laughs> I laughed along with Jessica. After all, the idea of a witch was just too ridiculous. Of course, once we started laughing like that, Maria, who believed in the witch, got angry. Eh, The witch is incredible! She can do anything with magic! Even kill! Even bring back to life! Even give love! Even take it! She can fly in the sky, can become invisible, can even make golden bread out of nothing! Ew! 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 Er, dang. My bad, we were just joking. 
Jessica apologized, sticking out her tongue, but Maria didn't accept it. She grabbed her notebook back out of my hands, and opening to some other pages, tried to prove that the witch existed. Oh. Those pages had colorful drawings of witches on them, and well conveyed the fantastical image Maria had of witches. It wasn't a normal sinister image of a crooked-nosed hag flying around on a broom, but a dreamlike person with unnatural powers who could do anything and wore a beautiful dress. It was just what you'd expect from an imaginative young girl. Flitting through the sky, crossing a rainbow, dancing around all night with a teacup and a teapot that would never get empty no matter how much you poured out of it. With the flourish of her staff, the stars in the sky would become candy and pour down. And flowers that produced sweets would bud by the roadside. Yeah, sounds like kid drawings. To Maria, witches were the only concept that could embody the magical dream that so captivated her. As she grew older, it was the last remaining thing that could give richness to her dull and plain everyday life. That's why Maria believed in witches. She's pretty similar to Kenzo, if you think about it. Because she's stubborn, she's heavily opinionated, kind of closed-minded. Granted, she's a kid, but she also has like the whole magic thing going on. So yeah. She didn't want that dream of hers to be tarnished. That's why she didn't want anyone to tarnish the epitaph which affirmed the existence of witches. Because the witch named Beatrice is Maria's dream. To Maria, the epitaph isn't a guide to the hidden gold, but magic to revive the witch. So it was a single link between Maria and the witch. Maria was very angry and clung to George. Jessica and I scratched our heads and apologized. It might not be possible to smooth things over again like the time she got mad in front of the portrait. Maria didn't seem willing to be easily consoled. Unlike Jessica and I, who hung our heads wondering what to do, Shannon timidly opened her mouth. Um, Maria, did you know? There's a ghost story about Beatrice that has been passed down amongst the servants. Eh? Uh, yeah, that's right. Shannon, tell us about it. I don't really know, but it's apparently pretty famous among the servants. What is this? A ghost story? Yes. It seems it's a story from before we were born. I also heard about it from my mother. Yes, it has been passed down since the time of the mansion's construction. The servants of that time whispered that the mansion had two masters, one of the day and one of the night. The tale that Shannon told was just like a typical campfire ghost story. If there was a forest with a witch living inside it, then of course the witch would come pay the mansion a visit from time to time. At some point, this ghost story naturally sprouted up between the servants. When people do the rounds a second time to check doors, windows, and locks that were supposedly closed, they'd find some of them left open. Lights that were supposed to be off were turned on, and lights that were supposed to be on went out. Things left lying around would disappear, and things would appear when no one had any memory of putting them there. When any of these things happened, the old servants would say that the witch had visited the mansion, invisible, and was playing pranks. Ew! See? She exists! Beatrice exists! Yeah, she exists. Long ago, it was always right before leaving for school that I wasn't able to find my bag and stuff. Maria puffed out her chest with an ooh-ooh, as though this was the final proof of the witch's existence. If I opened my mouth, Maria would probably be hurt again, so I didn't. I mean, you hear this kind of story everywhere. Depending on the place, they might blame it on a dwarf or an elf. The only difference is that they call it a witch on this island. Of course, walking around a vast, elegant mansion at night would be a little unsettling. It's an island devoid of people. Since the mansion is so drafty, walking around on the night of a thunderstorm would certainly be eerie. In addition, some servants have also seen will-o'-the-wisps and glittering butterflies dancing around. Oh yeah, I remember the butterflies, at least. Cannon also saw something like that when he went patrolling one night. And recently, you often hear servants talking about strange footsteps heard inside the mansion near midnight. We've whispered together that the Beatrice in the portrait sometimes makes herself invisible and walks through the mansion. It happened a while ago. But even I have heard footsteps while patrolling at night that resemble these stories. Woo, that's scary. Ah, but there's nothing to be afraid of. Beatrice is another ruler of this mansion, separate from the master. So there's no need to be unnaturally afraid. If you respect her, I hear she won't do anything bad. However, she can be quite terrifying if you don't respect her, right? Correct. I've heard that just before I began working here, Someone who spoke badly about Beatrice fell down the stairs and quit after receiving a large injury to their back. Because of that, there was a rumor between the servants that Beatrice's anger had been brought down upon this person. Ew. Anger will definitely be brought down upon 
Batware and Jessica. Ew. I'm sorry. I don't want her anger brought down upon me. I apologize, Maria. Of course, I also apologize to the witch. I'm sorry, Beatrice. Please forgive an outsider's nonsense. I'll apologize as well. I'm sorry, Beatrice. Will the witch be able to forgive us now? Ew. Don't know. Witches are fickle, so they forgive when they when they want to and don't when they don't. Okay, a nine-year-old saying fickle. Okay, I don't even use that word. Ew! That's no good. Maria, isn't there some kind of good luck charm that could prevent Batware and Jessica from suffering Beatrice's wrath? Maybe something that can block against magic? By relying on Maria, who was proud of knowing the most about witches, George was trying to revive her self-esteem. Once again, I've got to admire his ability to calm kids down. After taking a moment to cross her arms and seriously ponder whether there might be a charm that could save us, she started flipping through the pages in her notebook. I thought it was just a scribbled diary. Okay, now I remember the notebook from the show. Now that I think about it. Okay. But there also seemed to be quite a few pages that looked like they'd come from a book on black magic. Maria solemnly considered a group of these pages, which contained things that looked like magic circles. Apparently, Grandfather wasn't the only one with a black magic hobby. When Maria finally found what she was looking for, she snapped the notebook shut and threw it into her handbag. She then began fishing through that bag's contents. There seemed to be various jumbled up things in there. After a while, she took out various pieces of junk, although they were apparently important magical items to Maria, and repeatedly threw them back in, saying they were wrong. It was all a little humorous, just like when Doraemon took out the wrong tool. Whoa, look at that censoring, guys! <laughs> oh my god. They'll never know. Never! <laughs> oh my god. Finally, she seemed to discover what she was looking for. With a face that was unimaginably cheery when compared to the intense expression she had worn until now, she held those out to Jessica and me. Ew! I grabbed it and saw that it was a very cheap looking charm. It looked like a bracelet made from a plastic rosary. With a scorpion-themed metal attached, okay. Haven't you ever seen those cheap Zodiac-themed accessories? The kind you might win in a crane game at an ar arcade? It really looked like something like that. I've never seen those, but I can understand what he means. There were two of them. Probably one for me and one for Jessica. However, the very fact that there were two of them made made them feel more like cheap manufactured goods. Making it pretty hard to think of them as magical items. You're giving these to me and Batware? Ew! With these charms, you don't even need to worry about Beatrice, because scorpions have the power to ward off magic! Huh, really? Didn't know scorpions could do that. Ew, Batware doesn't believe! Ew! I'd said too much and angered Maria again. What the fuck? Maria took out her notebook again, pointing out various pages as she went on and on about how the scorpion had such incredible holy power that it had been used in magic repelling magical circles since ancient times. Holy fuck, there's nothing about scorpions that says that. What the fuck? I've heard about that from some of the other young servants. Aren't you the youngest one, or is that canon? Jesus Christ. Something about how the scorpion is drawn as a magic repelling symbol in sorcery. Huh, really? Ew. The scorpion protects against bad magic and calamity. An emerald brings peace to the heart. Therefore, its effects are twofold. Ew. That was a Kingdom Hearts cutscene in a nutshell. It's true. The scorpion wraps around the emerald and protects it. Yes, that certainly does sound like it'd work well. I, I really wanted to make fun of those worthless looking charms, but as I watched Maria explaining with all her, of her heart and, I, and realized that she'd found them for our sakes, I started to feel like it might actually work, even if it was just a prize from some game center. The material quality of the charm didn't matter. What mattered was the strength of her feelings. Even though I don't think of myself as the sort of loser who'd laugh at something like that. Okay, thank you. I apologize to Beatrice, but even if I do end up getting cursed, I'll be safe now thanks to Maria's charm. Right, Jessica? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Maria. Ew! Wear it on your arm when you want your heart to be at peace. Put it in your wallet and your money won't decrease. <laughs> if you hang it from a doorknob, bad things can't get in. It's a really convenient charm. What an incredible effect. If Maria gives it her confident seal of approval, then it surely must be reliable. Shannon clapped her hands together and Maria stuck out her chest. She was totally in a good mood again. It's probably best if we let her lead the conversation a bit longer. If it'll keep her in such a good mood. 
Come to think of it, she looked a bit bored when we were getting excited about the hidden gold. Probably because she couldn't keep up. Jesus Christ, can I get a joke in? <laughs> While eating the cookies Kumasawa had baked, Jessica and I asked Maria this and that about black magic. Why is it not white magic? Fucking racist, Sony apparently only black people can use magic. Dur dur dur! Maria happily chatted away in response to our questions. Each time, George and Shannon would act surprised or chime in. The clouds in the sky grew darker and darker, but we cousins really enjoyed communicating freely after a year of separation. And that's another break. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> hmm? Did I just feel a drop on my forehead? Huh? I wonder. As George rubbed his forehead, he looked up at the sky. Considering the color of the sky and the dampness of the air, it wouldn't have been odd for a raindrop to hit him. The wind also seemed to have grown a bit stronger. Ew. I didn't feel a drop. Only I didn't. Ew. Don't worry, neither did I. Anyway, I'm sure it'll rain so much tonight that everyone will get to feel plenty of raindrops. That's right. Maybe we should head back soon. Shannon looked down at her watch. It's probably well into the evening by now. Is it already time for you to return to your work? Yes. Thank you very much for allowing me to enjoy some time together with you all. Tell Kumasawa thanks for the cookies. Okay, everyone, help out with the cleanup. I did the wrong voice for George there for a second. Shannon declined our help, saying that this was a servant's job, but picking up dropped forks before the waitress has to is pretty much my purpose in life. We folded up the blanket, gathered up the trash, and helped clean everything up. Ew! The trash is getting away! Ew, ew! I won't let it escape. I'll grab it before Maria does. Ew! I'll grab it! Ew, ew, ew! Maria! Don't get your shoes wet. You'll be in trouble. To Maria, chasing after some trash sent flying by the powerful winds was just another game. By the time we finished, the wind was blowing pretty strongly. Probably a good time to head back. You've all helped me out a lot. Thank you very much. It looks like you're really out of time. It's okay if you head back first. George perceived from her hurried appearance that very little of her free time was left. Genji's very strict about time. If you don't show up where you're supposed to be at the right time, I bet he'll be pissed. We'll see you later. Do your best with your work. Yes, then if you will excuse me. After making a respectful bow, Shannon ran towards the Rose Garden. Okay, let's head back to the guest house. We can watch TV or something and relax a little. Ew! Wanna watch TV? Wanna watch TV? Ew! Then it's decided. Let's all head back and watch TV together. Maria, who wasn't done having fun, agreed once television was mentioned. We climbed up the gentle stairs and returned to the Rose Garden. That's a lot of screens of stairs, what the fuck? The wind had grown very strong and roses shook throughout the garden like ripples on the water. This might be our last chance to see these beautiful roses. I'll bet tonight's typhoon ruin this, ruins them. These roses might be done in by tonight's wind. You're right. Still, I think the roses were pretty lucky. After all, they got to welcome all of you before the typhoon. All flowers lose their petals eventually. But that means we can admire them even more when they're in bloom. That's right. Maria, burn this image into your eyes. At this moment, they're the best roses of the year. Ew. Burn into eyes! Right then, Maria suddenly clapped her hands. It looked like she'd remembered something. My rose! The typhoon will send it flying! Ew! Oh, you mean that sad-looking rose George marked with a ribbon? Maria apparently remembered where the rose was. Yeah, I forgot about that too. She ran at full speed. The rest of us followed her. Ew! Ew! Where was that again? I'm sure it was somewhere around here. We searched everywhere around that area, but was, it was only a single flower among all of these roses, after all. Even though we knew it was somewhere close by, we weren't able to find it. The winds making up the typhoon's front lines made roses throughout the garden undulate. It was almost like it was teasing us by making the location of Maria's rose impossible to find. Maybe it wasn't here. Let's try spreading out a bit, bit in our search. I, I almost said bitch, don't mind that. Sounds good. Let's go for strength in numbers. Hmm? What's up, Maria? As we made as we made to split up and search, Maria tugged on my jacket with an unhappy face. You could tell that she didn't want us to leave that spot. What is it? What's wrong? Eh. My rose is here. It's here. But it's not a, but it's actually not, right? 
Maybe it was on the other side of the flower bed. If we all look, we'll find it fast, okay? Ooh! It's here! My rose is here! Look for it! Look for it! Ooh! Maria stomped her feet in irritation. Oh boy. She pointed at that spot and said it was definitely there, but in actuality, it wasn't. Even so, Maria got mad when we said we were going to search elsewhere. We were at a loss for what to do. For a while, we had to stay near Maria and pretend to search through that rose thicket. But they can't find it. Eh. Eh. Not here. Not here. Not here. Eh. Maybe she's saying that it should be here, but isn't. Maria became increasingly irritated. Oh man, Maria's really losing her temper. Sometimes Maria starts to really care about really pointless stuff. If she gets what she wants, that's okay, but... You can't find something that isn't there. It's not good. Just when we were at a loss of what to do, Maria called out in a loud voice. Mama! Oh, oh! We could see Aunt Rosa in the direction Maria was waving her hand. Maybe she wanted to look at the garden one more time before the typhoon came. Or maybe she had some business at the guest house. Aunt Rosa was coming from the mansion. She quickly noticed her daughter's voice and came over. My, my, what happened, everyone? Are you looking for something? Look for it! Mama, you look for my rose, too! Ew, ew, ew! Your rose? We found an unhealthy rose around here and marked it. We tied a candy wrapper around it. But Maria, if I remember correctly, it was growing right in front and really stood out, didn't it? Unless it grew legs and ran off somewhere, it must have been somewhere else. Maybe you remembered it wrong. Oh, it is here. It is here. Power doesn't believe. Oh, oh. How many times do I have to tell you to stop saying ooh, ooh before you'll understand? Mama will look for it, so stay quiet. I've never seen Aunt Rosa be anything other than kind and gentle, so her anger surprised me a bit. I guess that would make sense. She does seem like she'd be the really nice aunt, but is mean to her kids. <laughs> Aunt Rosa began searching as well, so we went along with her for the time being. But we were already more than sure that it wasn't around here. So it didn't take long for Aunt, Reza Aunt Rosa to realize that too. The rose isn't here. Did you mistake this place for someplace else? There are so many roses around. Ew! Ew! That's wrong! It is here! Mama doesn't believe! Ew, ew, ew! I already believed you and looked hard for it, didn't I? But it isn't here! Ew, ew! But it is here! It is here, but it isn't! Ew, ew, ew! Then someone must have ripped it out. Anyway, stop saying ooh, ooh. You fucking monkey of a child. Ew, ew, ew! Who whipped out my rose? Who did? I said whipped. Oops. Give it back! Give it back! Ew, ew! Ew, 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 ew! How should I know? Stop it! Stop saying ooh, ooh! Bam! <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a scene I kind of remember. Aunt Rosa slapped Maria's left cheek with her palm. In that instant, Maria was shocked into silence. Of course, it was only for an instant. When Maria realized that her wish was being rejected, she started yelling even louder. Ew! 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 ew. My rose! My rose! Ew! 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 Didn't I tell you to stop that weird habit? That's why all the kids in your class make fun of you. Cut it out! Once again, her palm slapped Maria's cheek. Child abuse. This time, she didn't go silent. She choked as she started crying and began to bawl in an increasingly loud voice. Aunt Rosa was clearly irritated and lifted her hand once more to try and shut her daughter up. Aunt Rosa? Now, now, she's just a little kid, so there's no reason to get so serious. <laughs> Fuck, I burped. Oops, cutting tension. If tension was a rope, I just fucking cut it with a chainsaw by burping. Good job, me! I tried to cut in with a bitter smile, rubbing my hands together. But Aunt Rosa glared at me with a serious face, and I realized that I should have stayed out of this. I'm sorry, but could the rest of you go back to your room for a bit? I need to have a little talk with Maria. Ew, ew, ew! Nobody believes in my rose! Even though it was here! Ew, ew! Look for it! Look for it! Here! It was here! Ew, 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 ew! But it's not here! So you must have confused this place for somewhere else, right? Ew, 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 ew. It is here. It's definitely here. Ew, ew, ew. Then it disappeared. Give it up. Why? Why did it disappear? Why? Why? Ew, ew, ew. I don't know that. 
So stop saying ooh ooh. Ooh, okay, she just kind of knocked her out. <laughs> That's an ouchie. Aunt Rosa once again raised her hand, overcome by emotion, and slapped Maria's cheek. It was strong enough to knock Maria over. Hey, Aunt Rosa, even if she is your daughter, violence isn't the answer. I stepped between them protect to protect Maria, who was still on the ground, crying, ooh, ooh, I can't speak. I knew that, as an outsider, problems between parent and child were none of my business. But I wasn't brought up just to silently observe something like this. Don't you think it's weird, Battler? Are there any girls at your school who utter ooh, ooh? Well, I am in high school. But for an elementary schooler, I think saying ooh, ooh is pretty cute. Cute? Saying ooh, ooh is cute? Cute? My careless words seem to have earned me Aunt Rosa's wrath. Oh, fun. She grabbed my collar with a terrifying expression. Don't say such nonsense. Do you know how old Maria is? She's nine. She's a fourth grader, not a kindergartner. But she still makes that sound during class. Don't you get it? Do you know what they say about this kid when they bully her? Thanks to this weird habit, she still hasn't made a single friend. Don't turn your eyes from reality and carelessly call Maria cute. Think more seriously about this kid's future. I told you stop making that sound. Didn't I tell you to stop it? Fucking hell, can... Calm down, this was like a 30 second thing in the anime. She slapped her and it ended. Aunt Rosa struck Maria's quivering head, from which an increasingly unhappy voice was rising. I tried to stop it, but Aunt Rosa pushed me away. My back hit George. A long time ago, Aunt <laughs> George, I just w ran into you. Do you have to tell a story every fucking other minute? Yes, it's a habit. It's my forbidden action. <laughs> my forbidden action is going two minutes without telling a story. A long time ago, Aunt Rosa also thought of it as nothing more than one of Maria's baby words. But now that it hasn't been fixed even midway through elementary school, she's been worrying about it a lot. It's not really a huge deal. My brother sucked his fingers up through sixth grade. It's not a bad thing. How she talks isn't really that big of a deal, right? She'll never make it as an adult if she's like that. So even though it isn't fun to watch, this is a problem between parent and child. Well, even I get chewed out by mom all the time because of how I talk. <laughs> wow, and then she turns into a redneck. Cool. When they put it that way, maybe even a scene as painful as this isn't something an outsider like me should butt in on. Battler, when you were a kid, didn't you have any bad habits that you couldn't fix that got you into trouble? Well, one or two. On Parents' Day once, I kept getting yelled at in front of everyone, and it was embarrassing as all hell. Well then, you can understand how the two of them must feel right now. I'm sure they don't want us to be here now. You understand too, don't you, Jessica? I don't think anyone likes to be seen when they're being scolded. Let's go. We'll return to the guest house. Then, after Maria comes back, let's welcome her as if nothing happened. That's probably for the best, isn't it? We thought George's point was probably a reasonable one, and we may have been eager to use that reasonable sounding argument as a justification to retreat from this heart-rending scene. Is it supposed to say wrenching? I don't know. Jessica and I nodded at George, and we all left. We called toward M Maria, telling her that we were going to head to the guest house, but she didn't seem to hear, and we felt sort of guilty and shameless after saying it. In that case, look by yourself as much as you want. Mama doesn't care. Ew! I'll look for it! I'll look for it by myself! Even if Mama doesn't care! Ew, 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 ew. Have it your way! Subway! <laughs> Rosa's a Subway employee. That's a new canon. After blasting her with those last few words, Rosa spun on her heels and quickly returned to the Oh my fucking god, I can't get over Subway. <laughs> Maria probably viewed that as a cold gesture meant to injure. But that wasn't Rosa's intention. It was because the hand with which she had so emotionally struck Maria's cheek was still numb. It was because if she stayed there screaming, she might again be taken over by her emotions and continue slapping her daughter's cheek over and over. After Rosa left, Maria was left alone in the rose garden. The wind began to blow stronger and stronger, and every once in a while a raindrop would fall on her forehead. However, Maria couldn't leave that place. Not until she found that poor wilting rose. It had definitely been there. Even so, it wasn't. 
Even though she knew the place, and even though it had been there, it wasn't. All that shit over a rose, fucking Christ. Maria bitterly stared at the place it was supposed to be and thought frantically. Maybe the angle I'm looking from is wrong. Maybe the height I'm looking from is wrong. While gazing at a single point, Maria repeatedly stood up, changed her position, and continued to stare. The wind was getting stronger and stronger, but Maria kept on looking for that rose in front of the flower bed. <laughs> Music cuts. What next? Oh shit, it's a rain filter. Kinzo noticed the sound of the raindrops beating out the window. It seemed to be pouring down thickly. It had begun to rain later than the weather report had predicted. Kinzo approached the window as if being summoned by the sound of the rain. The sound of rain is a sound of silence. That sound feels quieter than any silence. I do like the sound of rain. It's very, very nice. That sound feels quieter than any silence, and makes humans remember that, in the end, they are alone from the moment they're born to the moment they die. You're late, Beatrice. Were those, ro were those words directed at the rainy sky? There was no one to be seen in the direction of Kinzo's gaze. Ooh, fuck. Well then, let us begin. Let us begin our banquet of miracles. This island has now been cut off from the world. Now there are none who can interrupt my ceremony. There are many fitting sacrifices for you. Four of my children, three of their companions, four of my grandchildren, me and my guests and my servants. You may devour as many as you please. The key of fate will select the sacrifices in accordance with the demon's roulette. If that roulette chooses me, even I will become your sacrifice. However, because of that, because I will bet on such madness, I will most assuredly bring forth a grand miracle. Come, devour to your heart's content. I will achieve victory over that roulette. Yes, I'll put everything on the line. First, I'll return the inheritance of the Ushiromiya family. Accept it. A fucking rain filter. Kinzo tore the window open, ripped the golden ring off his finger, and forcefully threw it away. At that time, the sound of thunder rang out, giving the illusion that the lightning had accepted the ring. Ouch. And, when you are resurrected, surely I will be the only- be the one who stands witness. I will survive until the end and watch over you as you awaken. So come, Beatrice. Welcome to my banquet. In exchange for all that I have created, show me another miracle just this once. Oh, Beatrice. Who boy. It was five now. And now it's six. Shit. It's a pretty climatic place to leave off. Yeah, we're gonna leave off there. Not nearly an hour, but hey. I don't feel like I'd get a, a better stopping point than that. We got a screen break and everything. Feel like I've said that before, but whatever. So that was a really intense episode. Holy shit. I mean, most of it was just talking. Well, that that's what this game is. It's talking. There's no choices or anything, despite being a visual novel. But yeah, that's going to be it for this episode. Hopefully next episode, Maria doesn't get slapped again. Because that was mean. That was real mean. Don't slap her. She's a good girl. And don't slap good girls. But with that being out of the way, that's going to be it for this episode. If you liked it, be sure to press the like button. And if you didn't like it, fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye!